Welcome to the World of Warcraft art panel. Please join us in welcoming to the stage members of the World of Warcraft art team. Welcome to the World of Warcraft art panel. Uh, my name, all right. My name is Rob Foote, and I'm the uh, senior art producer on World of Warcraft. Um, I'd like to take a minute to thank all of you for coming, especially early in the morning. Uh, it's especially impressive considering how many of you I watched close out the Hilton Bar last night. So, let me give you a synopsis of what you're going to see on this panel. Uh, We've got a lot of great things to show you, and what you're going to see is the, the work of over 40 of the artists on the World of Warcraft art team. Uh, they've been hard at work working on our new expansion. I don't know if you've heard of it, it's the Mist of Pandaria. So the Pandaria are something we've really wanted to do for a long time now, and we're really proud that we've been able to actually dedicate an entire expansion to the Pandaren and to their lands. We've also been in production for a long time, so this art panel, we've got a lot of content to show you. Now, to introduce you to the rest of the art team, I'm going to hand it over to the art director and my friend, Chris Robinson. Thank you, sir, and friend. Enemy. Ouch. Uh, so, we literally created a massive amount of content for this expansion. Um, and there's way too much to show you. We'd be here all week if we wanted to go through everything we've done. So uh, it's been very difficult to pare down. We think we came up with a pretty cool show for you guys. Uh, but before we get rolling with that, I just wanted to take a minute to introduce you to these people. So first and foremost, you know Rob Foote. I, got some, I have some pictures here. If I can get this thing to work. There we go. There's Rob Foote. Produ production mastermind of the universe. You know me, Chris Robinson, art director, and apparently I'm also a crazed homeless person if you look at this picture. <laughs> Mark Gibbons, uh, who you may not recognize because uh, he actually took his makeup. Uh, this is what he looks I like. Do, I can do the face. There you go. <laughs> so we require that he wear this makeup at work um, because we can't communicate with him if he looks like, like he currently does, but he wanted to show you all his beautiful face. So. Thomas Blue. Thomas Blue is our uh, character art manager and our lead technical artist. Um, he's also a millionaire in WoW, so whenever I need a loan, he's the guy I go to. <laughs> Gary Plattner, lead environment artist, part-time pirate. And uh, actually, this is pretty cool this year. We, have, we actually have a programmer up, which uh, when I created the graphic, I put some binary code behind him so that you could tell that he's a programmer. He lives in the Matrix. Uh, and he also, he was going to wear a t-shirt that said, not an artist, specifically, but uh, I thought the code was sufficient. So, um, cool, collected, German. Wendy Vetter, lead dungeon artist, also known as Darth Vetter, purveyor of finer things, which you gentlemen should be aware of. And uh, last, last but not least, the most serious member of our art management team is uh, Eric Browning who also appears to be from the future. <laughs> uh, so that's about it for introductions. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Mark Gibbons. And me. Talk a little bit about concept right. art. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Ooh, here we go. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. Um, You're welcome. Will the Walker concept artist. Uh, it's not to say I'm the only artist on the WoW team that does concept art. We have a, a, an amazing selection of, of guys and girls who are great sketch artists as well as being um, 3D modelers, texture artists and so on. What it really means is I'm the only guy whose skill set is so narrow I can't do anything else. Um, but the, uh, our, our player community has, uh, uh, has some other names for me. Crayon, crayon Wielding Monkey, I was called uh, just the other week. Wildly, wildly inaccurate, as you can see, if you look at the magnificent illustration there, I'm a pencil-wielding monkey. 
Uh, it's also been suggested that I be uh, <coughs> rendered down into soap. Uh, I like that one. Um, they weren't specific about a fragrance. Uh, I'm thinking um, uh, rum and eraser, possibly. So you might be asking, well, what is it, Mark, that you do on a daily basis that would provoke such a uh, passionate response from uh, a certain section of our community? Well, it's, uh, it's this. Yeah. Yeah, you're applauding. Uh, since, uh, since tier 10, um, I've been responsible for the design of, uh, of all raid sets. So what I thought I'd do today is start by talking a little bit about the, uh, uh, the process, the design process I go through to create these sets. Um, it all starts with a, a brief from design. Um, it'll usually just be the title of the set and maybe a couple of lines of, uh, of explanation uh, if there's a, a particular theme or uh, materials that they want to see in the armor. Um, and then I'm left to my own devices. Uh, and I approach it as I would um, you know, any other assignment. I, I look for sort of cool visual hooks, uh, ideas to hang a, uh, the design off, and a little bit of a backstory. I mean, for my, for my benefit, if nobody else's. But what I realized as the tiers started to appear, and, and as I got to hear what the public thought of them, um, I realized that players care more about the way that their character looks than anything else in the game. Um, and if you, you give them a, a set of armor, and you ask them to wear something that they're disappointed in, they will tell you about it uh, loudly and at length. So um, I realized that, that although there's a, there's a lot of humor, there's a lot of whimsy in, uh, in WoW, and I think players, in, players embrace that, they really don't like it if you're lighthearted um, with their characters, with, unless they're gnomes, because the gnomes embrace the city. Right. Uh, so here's a, here's a, a small selection of, uh, of sets from tiers 10 and 11 that, um, that proved pretty popular. Um, and one of the things that um, I find myself doing when, when the ideas come through from design is, is sometimes a little bit of back and forth, a little bit of wrestling over the ideas to try and to make sure that hopefully what I'm doing is cool and, and it's going to be something that players like. And the, um, the shaman set in the middle there, the, uh, Frost, which is Garb, is a good example of me turning around to design and saying, uh, uh, can we do something else? Because the original brief was, um, the title came through and it was Vestments of the Five Elements. And my reaction was, <laughs> bollocks. Five elements, so it's earth, air, fire, water, and... Um, love. Love, says Eric. Bless him. <laughs> you romantic old bugger. Could be love, could be bubblegum. Um, I, I, either way, it wasn't gonna be, you weren't going to be able to create a, a hanger, solid, cohesive design if you had to cover that kind of range of stuff. So I, I went back to design and said, can we, can we try again? And, and uh, to their credit... They said yes, um, and they said, uh, well, what about a, a Vrykul themed set, because this was in Northrend. Um, and I had a design for a, a Vrykul boss that never made it into the game. Uh, he had a huge shovel tusk skull underneath his cowl. Um, so I showed that to design again, said, yeah, we can do with that, we can, we can build a set around that. Um, and that's what we ended up with. And I think it's a mark of the, of the set's success that, um, when I was here last year, somebody had built that costume. And I think if somebody's going to go to the time and effort, gluing all that cardboard together, sticking all that plastic, and wear it for two days, it's, it, I probably did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The other thing I try and do is, um, is up the epic every time when, when the opportunity presents itself. Um, and that can, be, that can be tricky, that can be quite a balancing act because the, more, the bigger and the more elaborate uh, uh, the armor gets, the more potentially unwieldy and, and you, you run the risk of doing something a little bit ludicrous. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important that we, we try and uh, push, the, push the envelope um, when the opportunity presents itself. When, when you get a design through, or uh, a design come through and, and, and give you a brief for something, you think, oh, I think we could do something that's a little bit outside the box here. It can polarize opinion. You can sometimes get people who, who you love it or hate it. Uh, personally, I think that's preferable to just, eh, it, it's all right, it's okay. Eh, I don't mind, I'll wear it for six months. Um, I would rather have people love and, and hate the stuff. I mean, the um, Powden set in the middle yesterday, again, saw somebody walking around with it in, in that outfit. I, I wanted to go up to her and say, I'm sorry you've got to drag that around with you all day. She seemed to be having a good time. So, um, tier 13, the latest lot. Uh, I plucked two, uh, two examples at random, um, the Paladin and the Priest. Now these, are, these are, uh, are traditionally some of the hardest ones to get right, or certainly to make kick ass. Um, it's very easy to make a cool death knight, you know, it's a skulls, horns, black, plate mail, it's, 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 it's pretty straightforward business. But the Paladin and the Priest are um, tough to make uh, tough, really. But I think these work really well, I mean design gave me a, um, a, a great breeze to work from. 
Um, the Paladin, it, I mean, he's still got that uh, classic chivalrous Arthurian knight, but the, um, the feathered armor, the, the feathered blades of the, of the set really, really give it a, a, an aggressive stance. I think it works really well. The priest, I think, is even better because it's, um, it's I mean, to make a priest set that's edgy, that's a little bit sinister, a little bit creepy, um, it's, it's quite a challenge. And design suggested uh, a Venetian uh, uh, masquerade costume uh, and, and a blank uh, staring uh, face. Um, so pulling those together, uh, I mean, I think it gives priests an, uh, a chance to do something that's a, a little bit different, a little bit badass. And uh, um, I mean, hopefully, moving, moving forward with that stuff, we can, do, we can do more of that edgy stuff in the future. And talking about the future, I mean, what are we going to do next? Where, where can we see raid sets going? Um, it would be nice at some point uh, to go to a fully componentable system. So instead of it being um, helmet, shoulder pads, gloves, belt, boots, we can actually do the whole, a whole set of armor. So every, every piece is modeled individually. Um, we can put effects on individual pieces. We can, we can have them uh, animating a little bit. Um, plus, we can, we can hang attachments like swinging chains and uh, gemstones, all that, sort of, all that sort of stuff that makes making something epic uh, a, little bit, a little bit easier. You know, the, the, the players are getting a, a broad, cooler silhouette. All that little detail is actually rendered rather than being you know, overlaid on, a, on, a, on flat material. So that's, um, that's Raid Armor Sets. What I want to talk a little bit about now is um, Mr. Pandaria and the Pandarian themselves. So what do we know about the pandas um, currently in game? I mean, other than the, uh, the wandering brewmaster. I mean, you, there's not a great deal of, of, of background there in WoW. Uh, so it, it really, me really meant we went back to the drawing board, did a lot of research. Um, uh, I, I, um, you know, we, we're asking players to come and uh, explore this, this, this new continent. So we had to make sure that we, we, we built it from the, from the ground up. We built the lore, uh, the, the, the history, um, uh, the culture. So um, end of last year, we started doing research, researching a lot of, um, of Asian myths, um, the legends, the, the, the culture, the history. Uh, one of the things that, that um, um, design was keen to point out, that um, the, the Pandaren and a race are at peace with themselves. That's pretty unusual for World of Warcraft, you know? There's no petty factions, there's no rivalry within, within Pandaren society, but we still, to, you know, to hang quest lines off, but we still have to have that, that, that depth, that breadth of, uh, of story and history. So one of the things that um, we hit on, Asian myth features uh, uh, animals an awful lot. It's about ancestor spirits, I mean, that, ancestor worship, that's, that's, a, that's a big thing in, uh, in, in Asian culture. Um, and animals are, are featured very highly in, uh, in, in those myths, and um, they, they're usually tied to a group of other themes. There'll be a, a, a compass point, a, a, an element, um, a color, all, all these things. Um, associated with, uh, with this one, uh, one creature. So the, the four uh, ancestor spirits that we decided on were the white tiger of the west, uh, the red crane of the south, the jade dragon of the east, and the black ox of the north. And these, you'll see, I mean, these are obviously in statue form, um, but you'll see uh, these, uh, their style, their influence in all the different uh, regions of, of Pandaria. But how does that translate to the Pandaren themselves? Well, these are aspects of the Pandaren uh, psyche, if you will, uh, and we decided to build some clans around them. So you got the white tigers of the north there, uh, military, austere, um, the, the red cranes in the top there, um, flamboyant, passionate, uh, the, um, the red crane element is, is fire. So there's a lot of conjuration, a lot of sources of the mages in the, in the red cranes. Um, jade dragons, uh, as you can probably tell from the sketch, um, serene, meditative. Um, I suppose a real world equivalent would be Shaolin monks. And in the middle we've got the shadow pan. The shadow pan is a little bit different. Um, they're darker, they're edgier, a little bit, a little bit sinister. They're panda ninjas. We want panda ninjas. And the shadow pan are, are engaged in a, in a timeless struggle with the Shah. What's the Shah? I hear you ask. Hey, what's the Shah? What's the Shah, man? Well, um, one of the things uh, when I was doing research I, I read up about was, uh, was Feng Shui. Now to this unenlightened Westerner, it's the Chinese art of furniture arranging. <laughs> but it's a lot, it's clearly a lot more than that. I mean, it's, it's an ancient, it's an ancient law. Um, 
But I thought, well, what if the Shah were a, um, was a physical force, a manifestation? You know, what if, what if the, uh, um, the, sh the Shah being the darker side of, uh, of the Feng Shui? Qi is the channeling of the positive energies. The Shah is the, is the dark stuff you try to disperse when you arrange your couch. But what if, it was, what if it was real? What if it had power and menace? And what if events of the cataclysm uh, and the uh, Horde and Alliance arriving in Pandaria threw the Shah into ascendancy? So suddenly it's about wrestling, the, wrestling balance back into the world. Um, and that seemed to fit with the culture we were developing for the Pandaren too. Um, so I mean, his, his examples here of the sort of the idea, you have Shah, the little Shah, the little smoky moats that you find you know, scurrying around a house. Um, and they, but they build, they grow, and they get m more powerful and bigger and more menacing. We did toy with the idea of a little bear-on-bear -bear action. Perhaps the, perhaps the shark can possess the pandera and you find yourself fright, fighting your brothers. Um, but of course, um, wouldn't be World of Warcraft without big bosses. You know, I mean, how else are you going to get that raid armor that I talked about earlier? So in places where, uh, in places of great suffering, the shark. Uh, pools becomes more powerful uh, and that's when you get the, the huge bosses that you expect to see in, uh, in, in our raids. And that's it for me. Uh, I'm now going to hand you over. Thank you very much. Thank you for your indulgence. Bless you. Bless you. Uh, I'm going to hand you over now to Thomas Blue who, uh, who has the odious task of turning these scribbles into uh, in-game models. So, Thomas. Thank you, Mark. That was very informative. Thank you. So I'm Thomas Blue, and the video that we're not seeing, no. Nope. This is what we get for having a, a presentation in the morning. <laughs> I did go back. Oh, so this, this is the first panel, and there's the video. Awesome. It's very dark. So this is where you see the character team. Okay, so they're 10 of the hardest working artists in the MMO industry. And these are the guys who make weapons, armor sets, critters, mobs, bosses, pets, and player characters. As we planned to add the Pandaren, we looked back to what we had done before, and we had a lot of existing ideas. They existed in Warcraft, and now we wanted to reintroduce them to World of Warcraft. Some of our ideas were cute and cuddly. Others were fierce and vicious. We'd made a model more than five years ago to put into WoW. So adding Pandarans aren't completely new. And we've redefined that idea. And after making the base model, we have to make it work with all of our player systems. So we have to add things like boots, gloves, capes, so that way they can wear all of the existing armor sets and all of the weapons in WoW. It takes several months of artist collaboration to finish a new player model. So the Pandaren come to us with their own set of enemies. Yeah, oh, we're rolling. Hey, hey, are we? are. Hey, so there's the character. Hey, by the way, good job, Blue. That was yeah. badass, dude. <laughs> Excellent work. <laughs> So you can see some of these character artists over at the artist stage later this afternoon. You can catch Rob Sevilla and John McConnell. They'll be doing demonstrations of how uh, we make weapons and some armor pieces. I will. So. As we planned to add the Pandaren, we looked back to what we had done before. These are those examples of our concepts and creatures that we'd had in Warcraft before. As you notice, some of them are cute and cuddly. Some of them are fierce. Most of these concepts were done by Chris Metzen and Sammy. even a dark version of the Pandaren. So this is our model from five years ago. 
know, it was good, but Chris redefined how he wanted to see them today. So here we're going to see adding the gloves, boots, and other geo sets needed for dressing up pandas. And here they are wearing some of the new clothes and old clothes. Notice the faces, they're very expressive. Gangster bear. All right, so here are the Hozu. They're one of the uh, enemies of the Pandaren. They're a crazed monkey race. And here we have the verming. They're an obnoxious rabbit-like creature with a vegetable worshiping fetish. <laughs> and this is how some of our artists envision the new mantid. Okay, so those are some of the new races going into the new expansion. But the character team has been working on creatures for both the expansion and the upcoming 4.3 patch. And here's a small collection of their recent work. I mentioned armor sets earlier. In the past six months, we've made raid sets, dungeon sets, PvP season sets, and starting Pandaren sets. We make between three and five color variations of every set. So in that six month time, we've added more than 100 new armor set looks. I'm also the lead technical artist. And this is the tech art team. Tech artists are the unsung heroes of game art development. They make tools and define processes that allow artists to focus on making great art. One of the many roles that a tech artist can have is that of a rigger. A rigger is a person who puts bones and specialized controls onto a model that animators then use to bring creatures and characters to life. The Pandaren has our most modern rig with an amazing facial system that allows for great amounts of personality and expression to be placed on top of already incredible animations. Thank you. Awesome job, Blue. A little technical difficulty, no worries. So, uh, unfortunately, our lead animator can't be here with us, in, uh, or this morning, I guess. Uh, so, you're going to have to bear with me trying to get through talking about our animations. So, I'll try to make it exciting for you. But before I get started on that, um, are you guys excited about this stuff? Like, is Pandaric. Okay. What about, are you, uh, how about you guys? How excited are you? Nice. What about you guys? Nice. And you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much because we're stoked and we've been working really flipping hard to make this stuff kick ass and I think so far we've seen some pretty cool stuff and sorry about the character uh, video. Clearly we're not the only ones who were drinking last night and everyone's a little hungover this morning. So uh, 
let's talk about animations. So our animation team, we have eight animators and one effects animator, uh, which means that these guys are responsible for creating over 800 animations per expansion, which is a daunting number because animation is a lot of hard work. So one of the things we try to do with animation is that uh, even though all these, all these guys are working on the same, and girls are working on the, working on the same, or I'm sorry, women are working on the same animation at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that the end game looks like one person made all of, the, all of the animation for one character. So at any one given time, every animator in the bullpen will be working on, say, the Pandaren or the Mantid or any one race, and they all work together as a group to make sure that uh, this stuff is coming together and looking, looking consistent. This is a little bit of a movement animation, and we wanted to break it out and kind of show you guys against a white screen what we've done recently to kind of upgrade our character animation system. Uh, we have an awesome rigger. Alexis Mead has done a fantastic job making these guys uh, come to life. Blue talked a little bit about that. Here you can see how it all came out. Um, one of the new things that we're really excited about is squash and, sh squash and stretch, um, as well as almost 10 times the number of bones in the face that we previously had in, in older uh, character models. So uh, what that allows us to do is get the expressions that you'll probably see if you're, uh, in his face as he's jumping around. And also, if you watch his belly when he's running around doing this stuff, you can see that jiggle. We weren't previously able to do that, and uh, it's opened up a whole new realm of stuff we can accomplish with animation. And he's bored with what I'm saying, so he's going to meditate. So that's the conversation animation. One of the things that's uh, super important with, with these guys especially, uh, but characters in general, is nailing the silhouette. These monk animations uh, illustrate that point against this white background because uh, the animators work really hard to make sure that in any viewpoint you could really tell uh, the breakdown and the silhouette of what the character is actually doing. Um, these attack animations have to happen within a second, so they're working really hard to get across exactly what the character is doing in that short period of time. And I'd like to say that uh, that they filmed me doing this stuff for reference, but unfortunately it was a combination of a couple people on the team who are a little bit better, better at uh, martial arts than I am, and then studying, you know, cool uh, Shaolin-style martial arts uh, and, and that kind of stuff. You can tell I've well practiced on this animation a bit, right? So, um, unarmed combat was, was very important to us. We wanted to make sure that it had that, that really cool kind of Shaolin Kung Fu Monk style. And then all of a sudden they have to have this weapon. And, and uh, game animation is interesting because not only do these things have to work with unarmed combat, but all of a sudden they have to hold a, hold a sword or hold a staff. So a challenge for the animation team is making sure that the animations they do in un unarmed combat come through when they're holding a weapon. Um, and this is sort of illustrating exactly what that's doing. You can see all these animations if you play the demo. It's kind of a breakdown of exactly what we've done for the basic animation so far. This is our uh, effects team, essentially. So what we're trying to do here is show that uh, using the claw system, we want to get a much more dynamic uh, relationship between the character and the effects that are happening so that when he's casting and doing his summoning, you can actually see it affecting the character a lot more than it ever has before. And while you're watching these last 10 seconds, I just want to congratulate my mom for hitting level 80 before she came to visit us at BlizzCon. Congratulations, Linda. All right, so uh, let's get started on the rest of it. So now that we have these guys uh, rigged up, we've created them, the character team has done an awesome job of building these little dudes, we've got to have a place for them to live, Pandaria. So this is uh, going to illustrate a little bit of, like, what we're doing with the environment and how this all comes together. And I'm going to hand it off to Gary Plattner to tell you a little bit about how that all happens. Gary? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, you guys. All right. It's amazing what's involved to get a new character into the game. So good job. Incredible. So let's start talking about all the new content that we've been working on that all of you are going to be playing very soon. Hopefully. Definitely. Very hopefully. All right, that looks cool. Okay, like I said, my name is Gary Plattner. I'm the lead environment artist on World of Warcraft. I'm here. And I'm Marco Kugler. I'm the engine team lead. Thank you, Marco. Together, we are going to talk about what it takes 
to put together a world for the World of Warcraft. All right, we were very excited to do this content. Like Chris uh, said earlier, we had wanted to do pandas a long time ago, and uh, China and Asia offer so much and so many resources. We weren't really sure exactly where we wanted to go, so the first thing we do is just to start to put stuff on paper so we can figure out the direction we want to go. We knew we wanted a giant turtle. We knew we wanted a whole new panda zone. But until we start getting the things on paper, our team really isn't sure like where exactly we're going to go. So we'll start to make these concepts. Some of these are marks. So we'll start to make these concepts. These concept pieces are super important. They're going to give us a color palette. They're going to tell us what the mood of the zone is going to be. But most of all, they're going to give us a hint of what the final zone could look like. Beautiful. Nice. All right, so believe it or not, there's only five of us that work on the exterior environment team. And it's our responsibility to make all of the natural elements of the game. So we'll make all of the tile sets for the ground and the trees and rocks and things like that. And we work very closely with exterior level designers. There's about 10 of those guys. So all together, there's 15 of us that build the world and place it using our editor. And, and we're all doing this by hand, by the way. So everything's hand placed, everything's hand painted by the 15 of us. Thanks. So I've talked a lot before, if you've ever been to BlizzCon before, I've talked a lot about trees and rocks and grass and the environment, but I've never really talked before about the importance of lighting and our skyboxes. Lighting is huge, it's very emotional, very different. So here's the starting zone. What if we were to take this zone and completely relight it? We didn't change any other art, all we did was change the sky and change the direct light. They all look pretty cool, but they're all very different. So if we want a zone to feel scary, or even dangerous, or pleasant, or happy, we're going to start doing that with lighting. You might recognize some of these skyboxes, by the way, too. What a big difference. So skyboxes. Skyboxes are another element that we can use to just add a little more whimsy, add a little more elements to the game. So all they are is a big piece of art that we can use to replace in the horizon. Let's us add a, a, a little more style to the game, a little more difference. Uh, we first started adding uh, skyboxes in Nagram, was our very first one. And we don't always have to use that. We could use procedural sky like this is computer generated sky, looks pretty good. Or we'll go with the skybox if we want to be a little more stylistic. Or we'll go with both, like in this case. This is both a procedural sky and a hand drawn sky. Really cool. Another big part of the game is something we call tile sets. All these are are little textures that we can use to paint on the ground to create the game. There's been a lot of technical advancements in tile sets for this expansion. One of the coolest things, I think, okay, here I'm just painting a texture at a normal resolution. We've used textures at about uh, 256 forever before we're using 64, but check this out. I can actually scale the texture and scale the resolution of the texture. That's incredible. So I can make one texture that could replace the work that I have to do with three or four textures. So I'm doing one texture uh, that can do all that work, and now I'm just painting in a little bit of rock or a little bit of grass. It just adds more creativity to the game. I think that's amazing. This is our editor, by the way, that we use to create WoW. So that's scalable tech. Another really cool thing you'll see in a second is something called height-based texturing. But it lets me paint, for example, snow inside the rocks of another texture, inside the cracks of another texture, rather. If I wanted to do this before, even just a few months ago, I would have had to create a texture with snow in the cracks, create a texture without snow, or create one you, you, you know, a, a combination of rocks. I would have had to do that with three or four textures. Now I can basically take a rock texture and a snow texture and combine them any way I want to. This was impossible to do just a few months ago. 
it is incredible. Thanks, Marco. Very new tech, really exciting. Just helps us make the world better. So check this out, this next scene. I'm gonna be painting some rock textures on the ground and I'm gonna lightly paint, we have pressure sensitive tablets, so I can lightly paint a little bit of lava between the cracks of another texture. So the harder I push, the more that lava comes through. Isn't that awesome? I would have had to make all those separate textures if I wanted to do that last year. So I'm gonna add a little bit of vertex shading, darken it a little bit, and pop a little red vertex on top of that, just to bring it out. Boom, done. Really cool. So, all right, hold off here. Thank you very much, but all these new tech, tech uh, examples have just made us make the world uh, better and easier and uh, more fun to make. Right, Marco? Thank you, Gary. On the engine team, we're constantly thinking of ways we can improve the look of WOW and just generally make it easier to create content. With this expansion, we came up with a technique that allows objects to pick up the terrain texture in their vicinity. This way, we can like embed caves into the terrain or do common things like put the terrain on the back of a gigantic turtle. We now also support secondary animation uh, via dynamics. Hopefully we'll be able to bring those chains that Mark was mentioning to life. Um, we're starting with the Pandaren belt. However, the largest enhancement in this version of the engine is in the lighting. Shadows in WoW traditionally only darken the object rather than obscuring the light source. This resulted in a flat look, even for objects that have a lot of geometric detail. By changing how we calculate the lighting and how we apply it to the scene, we can improve this dramatically. This effect is achieved by looking at the depth information in the scene and then trying to figure out how a location is obscured by its neighbors and then combining that with the lighting. So this is just that mask getting applied here and then a few before after shots. With these changes, we feel that we can make the environments look better than ever before in WOW. And we hope to give you many exciting vistas in your journey through Pandaria. Thanks, Marco. Awesome work. Good job. Marco did an incredible job. And I have to say, after we rehearsed, we were having lunch, had a few drinks in him, and he says, Gary, don't get excited about the scalable textures. <laughs> but how could I not? It's incredible. For me as an artist, he's just given us more tools to make this expansion the very best one that we've ever done. Absolutely. So thank you, Marco, and the thank you, Gary, and everyone else. Thank you, guys. So now that we've created a beautiful environment for you to explore. Uh, we're gonna move on to some real excitement from the only girl on the team, Wendy, who has... On the panel. On, yes, sorry. And uh, uh, her team is responsible for all of the buildings and the incredible dungeons that you see in the game. Thanks, Gary, for that introduction. <laughs> also, you're not the only girl on the team. Yeah, let's clarify uh, that. Okay. The only <laughs> Eric used to be a girl. girl on the stage. Oh. <laughs> Stay on top. I'm here. getting that one in early because I know it's coming up. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Way to out him at BlizzCon, man. Sorry, Eric. Erica. <laughs> and play. There we go. 
So hi everyone, my name is Wendy Vetter, uh, apparently the only girl on the panel, uh, that, and I'm the Dungeon Arc lead for the World of Warcraft team. So while Gary's team has been busy coming up with some amazing looking environments for this expansion, uh, it's the dungeon team's responsibility to come up with the architectural style and the culture kit for the races, um, like the buildings and of course the dungeons uh, that you all play in the game. Um, so for the Pandaren, we had a smattering of information, but not a lot to go on, like Mark was mentioning. So just to get the ball rolling, we just kind of started to come up with some questions to uh, figure out who the Pandaren are. There we go. So where do the Pandaren come from? Uh, what's their background? What's their personality traits? Are they fat, thin, <laughs> muscular? Uh, what do they eat? I know this sounds like a strange question, but there was some debate whether or not they were going to be uh, veggie eaters or meat eaters, and the meat eaters won, so whatever that means. Um, what kind of skills and characteristics do they have? Uh, basically, how do we go about describing the Pandaren culture? Uh, one way we get inspired uh, begins with some brainstorming meetings. Our brainstorming meeting follows around 4 o'clock on a Friday. Okay, so while it may seem we're using a brainstorming meeting as an excuse to just drink uh, wine and eat really good cheese, um, truthfully, the dungeon team doesn't need any kind of excuse to drink and eat really good food. Um, we actually do talk and chat and throw ideas around and try to get the creative juices flowing. Uh, we also invite other teams along um, to join in the fun and uh, uh, we try to make it a collaborative effort, um, which is kind of important for us, and I think it's one of the values here at Blizzard, being collaborative. So we were lucky this time around to have Dave Kozak, our lead quest designer, um, help shed some light on uh, who the Pandaren are with his uh, story time hour, as he was called. This also fell around Dave Friday. Dave's right there. <laughs> He's right there. He's looking at you. for pointing that out. Uh, this also fell around 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. So at being the dungeon team, we brought our wine and cheese. Um, uh, we recorded the meeting, and uh, just to give you a little bit of a caveat, uh, it is design ideas, so it is subject to change. Um, here he's talking about Lu Lang, who's kind of a central character, a central role uh, for the um, starting zone, which uh, hopefully you all had a chance to play here, um, back there on the machine. Yes, yes, hopefully. If not, go do it, but wait until after this panel. <laughs> get that staff out of his hand now. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> All right, come on. 
Aha, there we go, early concepts. Okay, so once we had a pretty good idea about who the Pandaren were, um, our team started coming up with some preliminary concepts and ideas. Um, I wanted to show you just kind of the, the progression. This darn thing. I don't even know what I'm aiming at. There we go. Ah, wireless. Okay. Um, as Mark said, sky's the limit, anything goes. Um, you know, we have some gorgeous concepts here, some really nice silhouettes, and even though we didn't use them necessarily verbatim, it's, uh, it's important it kind of shows the evolution of the design that, uh, to what you see in the game today. So, what did we come up with? Uh, we know that the Pandaren are a very colorful and creative race. Uh, they're into balance and harmony, uh, at one with the earth, uh, I call that stuff. Uh, and we really tried to exemplify that in the temples and the building structures and their housing that you see in the, in the game. So for the starting zone especially, we really wanted it to feel very um, special and, and almost ethereal, a place that you would never want to leave. We also wanted their homes to feel very cozy and inviting. Um, one of the challenges we had with this race was that we had to fill a whole entire continent with Pandaren structures. And as Mark had mentioned, there's the four clans, each with their own characteristics and design. So how do we go about doing this? Well, um, we started with the base structure, and we kind of tweaked the textures, changed out the colors, um, either simplified or um, exaggerated the silhouette, um, depending on where they were placed in the zone, just so they felt more cohesive with their surroundings. So the brewery, okay, very important part for the Pandaren. Uh, one of the highest honors of being a uh, Pandaren is, is becoming a brewmaster. So it's no surprise that we have a whole entire zone dedicated to the Pandaren just making brew. Um, I had plenty of volunteers on the dungeon team willing to go to breweries, sake houses, Oktoberfest, um, beer tasting festivals, many, many nights and overtime even, just so they could get a clear picture, although probably that's in the morning, uh, of what it means to be a brewmaster. So what we ended up with was um, kind of a simplified version um, using a lot of wood and bamboo, kind of pared down. Um, the idea was just to make it so that um, they didn't have to worry about their housing because the most important thing for them to do is to make Pandaren brew. So last but not least, let's talk about dungeons. And I know you're all out there, the dungeon players. <laughs> Hear it. Yay. Um, so I wanted to give you a sneak peek of the four dungeons that we've been working on in the last couple of months. Well, I guess it's been four or five months. Um, and I had each of the artists that is in charge of the dungeons kind of give you an overview of what stuck out to them and how they pulled some of the characteristics of the Pandaren into the dungeons they're creating. The Great Wall divides the entire continent of Pandaria. It's a really big wall. Uh, it was built uh, not by the pandas, but by the Mogu. They're an older, more militant race that was in charge before the, before the Pandarans were. When the Pandarans do rise to power, they see the need for the wall and uh, have maintained it ever since. The wall itself needed to be darker and less ornamental than some of our other uh, Pandaran buildings. This is a really big structure, so we left the majority of the wall pretty stark. We did things like use darker colors and uh, use monolithic shapes to give it a real solid and uh, an imposing presence. The Great Gate is the only place on the wall where we went a little more ornate, a little more colorful. This is where all the action happened, so we wanted it to uh, stand out. I think with the Ghost Brewery, we didn't want to... It's, it's supposed to be taken over by spirits, but it's not supposed to be like, you know, haunted and scary. So something kind of, you know, uh, fun, you know, and not, not like spooky. Uh, it's kind of like the feel that we try to go for. Well, basically I just kind of looked at a lot of the classic um, 2D films, you know, 
they always have a lot of great uh, artwork, especially the painted uh, backgrounds. Um, so that, that's always a good resource. Um, and then again, again like uh, references from like a lot of the rice uh, sake breweries in China. It's always a good source. Um, a lot of the old uh, Warcraft 3 artwork and Sammy stuff is like very colorful. So I always try to like bring my, my stuff like you know just as colorful, just as stylized, kind kind of differentiate it from like you know other artwork. This temple was as challenging to make as I think it will be for players. It was imagined as a massive ancient 1,000 year old temple hanging off the easternmost point of Pandaria. This dungeon was going to be unique because players would be able to choose from three separate paths. So we knew that this would be quite an undertaking. The Shadow Pan are the Pandaren warriors of the Shah. Up in the, uh, the high mountains of the Kunlai summit. The Shah being a dark energy and all, the Shadow Pan make it their duty to bring balance to the island as a force of good. In fighting the Shah, however, the Shadow Pan have taken, it, uh, taken in some of that darker energy, so they're a little edgier, as if a little of that darker force is corrupting their sensibilities. So with that in mind, the Shadow Pan are more aggressive, a little more stark in nature, uh, so I made an environment with those ideas in mind. Okay, let's hear it for the dungeon team. Okay, so now that you've seen the Pandaren uh, character design, uh, we've applied the animation, you've been able to see the environment that he's going to be running through and some of the dungeons and the housing that uh, uh, he will be using, um, I'm going to now turn it over to Eric Browning, who's in charge of the prop team. I think I forgot my presentation, the whole thing. I've been so full of anxiety sitting here, afraid that my fellow artists out there are going to catch me sitting like this. <laughs> and I, I, so everything's out of my head. I'm just thinking about that this whole time. Oh, am I doing it? Am I doing it? So I'm going to stand up, walk around. Uh, so my name is Eric Browning. I've got an awesome animation to show my name is Eric Browning. Go away, panda. Oh. Eric Browning, prop art lead! So I'm going to talk about propagating Pandaria. Get it? It's a joke. Never mind. It's not the same as panda propagation. That's a different panel. So let's take a look at 500 plus new props that we've made for this expansion. Together. There they are. Soak it in. I like that one right there. I don't like that one, but that one is awesome. So thank you. Enjoy the show. So uh, going back a while, our early concepts, our process always starts with lots of uh, reference uh, gathering. Uh, yeah. And then we draw. We draw like crazy. Lots and lots of pictures. Sometimes even using a pencil and paper like old man Gibbons would do. Uh, old fart Gibbons. I've told you about that before. <laughs> so uh, at this point, it's all about putting down as many ideas as we can. Check this out. It's a goldfish powered hovering panda mount. I think it's. Yeah, no, you. No. No. Does anybody want this? Yeah. No! <laughs> Bad players! You're in trouble Because Chris now. said you can't have this. It's too awesome. Probably blow up your computer. So uh, we're trying different, different looks, uh, ideas for exterior uh, stuff. Uh, in the upper left, the frog flute, um, or the frog arena of time as I like to call it. I thought it could be World of Warcraft, the Frog Arena of Time. Whole different uh, game if we ever do consoles again. Um, banners, which I'll show you some of these later. 
Um, lots and lots of ideas. We have to fill up all these houses, all these dungeons, exterior areas, and the designers at this point are desperate for stuff. They're also working and they're making, um, uh, putting the zones together and stories are being written. Uh, so they're waiting on us. I'm going to touch on that shortly. Um, oops. I'm not going to get to see that one. Um, funny story. So this circular uh, motif that you see a lot in the, uh, um, the interiors, I was thinking that these are, these are bears, right? So they hibernate. And, and so we'll kind of pull, we're, we're grabbing at straws early on. Like what kind of element can we pull from to, to describe their, uh, their life? Well, um, what you may not know, this is a little inside baseball, but the Pandarans are based on pandas. Yeah, I, yeah, pandas. So uh, pandas in turn are based on bears, but unlike real bears, pandas don't hibernate. And I didn't know that, and so I kept pushing my team, oh, you gotta do it, you gotta be like the, the bears, because they sleep and they'll be all comfy, and, uh, and so we'll make this round den shape, and then they're, they're, it'll look like they love to be at home. And um, yeah, Eric, why don't we make a quest where you get your head stuck in a honey pot, too? <laughs> it's my uh, stereotyping the, the bears. Just got tasked. So, uh, uh, anyway, so uh, this is a training prop. You probably saw this. It's one of the first ideas. It's very simple, but th we started to get sort of an idea of like what uh, the shapes would be like. Um, none of these got used. It's mine, that's why I'm sad. Uh, tools, everything is kind of big and, and pretty simple. Uh, and crates, I love the crates. We always have to have crates. And exterior fences, a balloon that you may or may not have seen today. I just noticed last night, a lazy artist, he just threw actual panda bears in there. They're not even the characters, just bears. <laughs> just throw, just put a bear in there. So now we bring it all together. We take all these ideas, all of the, uh, the momentum, the creativity that we put together, and we have to collate this and organize this into a central database. And there it is. <laughs> now, the producers at this uh, point, um, or nursemaids, as I like to call them, uh, they have the job of taking all of our ideas and putting, putting them into a... Um, a, a task list and a schedule with, with uh, durations and times for how long it's going to take us to uh, make this stuff and then tell us this will be done in 2018, the ideas that you guys have, and then work with us to make a more realistic schedule that we can actually finish. Um, that's a schedule. Oh, look at that. Tasks. Lots of tasks. <laughs> Lots of tasks. Uh, I imagine this back and forth process that we do for the producers, for them I think it's sort of like explaining a sandwich to a jar of butterflies. Um, for the artist, the process is more like you're a child and you've been given puppies, a litter of five puppies that you've named and you love them and your dad hands you a gun and says, <laughs> you can keep three. So uh, again, crates. Ever since Crash Bandicoot, I've been obsessed with crates, and they, they, they're like green bean poisonous in a game. You have to have crates, and uh, uh, these are ours. They're very fancy crates. They're so fancy, I wish I had one of these at home. They're our nicest crates. Um, I love them. Um, exterior stuff, we did a bunch of weapons. You guys have all uh, uh, clicked on these now many times to satisfy a quest. Um, Early on, we're doing lots of exterior stuff because that's, that's where the designers are working and they need, uh, as they're building up the environment, they need to put things out there, they need to fill out the areas. Walls, uh, that training gear, that's all very useful because they can get a lot of reuse out of it. We thought of the art direction for the um, pandas, we broke it down into three, uh, three basic uh, sort of classes. We have the city bears which would be the more concrete, um, sculpted stuff, uh, a little more uptown. We have the uh, country bears, 
and um, that would be more rustic. They'll be like the breweries, um, the, the farms. And then we have the universal bear, which would be anything. That just sounds kind of cool, though, universal bear. Um, this would be stuff you could use anywhere. So obviously banners. This is very sad, though, by the way. These banners are so awesome that now we have to redo all the banners in the entire game because these are the best banners we've ever had. Uh, turn, you. So how the props help describe the Pandaren. Um, the props should, if they're doing their job right, you should walk by them and kind of get a sense for who owns them or what they're all about. Uh, so we made lots of shrines. This speaks to their, their spirituality. Um, the interior's very cozy. They like to curl up with a good book. They've got uh, their pots and pans and their neat circular thing based on hibernation. Um, <laughs> tools. The tools are simple, work the land tools. There's no machinery. Um, they uh, put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you and I. And barrels. More barrels than any other race in the game, I think. Um, this is called over-delivery. So an observation. When I'm looking through these, uh, we use this little red motif on the, um, a lot of the objects uh, to show this is owned by pandas. And the more I looked at these, I thought, you know, those look like guys. Like, they've got, uh, it's a guy with a bandana on it. And so I put funny eyes on them. <laughs> they're totally guys. They're, they're like a, a team. <laughs> Just something I noticed. Um, books. Lots and lots of books. This speaks to their knowledge. They're seeking knowledge, remembering it, reading it, writing it. They're monks. They've got the tables where they're they're recording things. Um, we have lots of this stuff. And what's really neat about this is the uh, text, all the characters. Um, we had to make a language that would be cohesive through all, everything. It would be convincing when you looked at it. And we uh, made a whole um, language that has characters with uh, their meanings associated with them. So when you go through Pandaria, if you have the time and wherewithal, and a chart like this, you can actually translate the scrolls that are hanging on in the temples. Um, this one, which you probably clicked on yesterday, what it actually says is, for in the flow, or in the true heart of the Pandaren, the flow of peace speaks like the wings of many birds, and upon those wings are carried the feathers of a thousand dreams. Actually, that's crap. I, I made that up. Um, but what I did do is I took that chart that one of the artists made, and then I, for this presentation, translated that scroll for real. Does anybody want to hear what it really says? Yeah. This is a big secret. Here it goes. Travel, teacher, village wind, family, stranger, me, city wind, instruction, city wind, go, teacher, go. Visitor, me, wind, travel, building, wind, stranger, me, city. Go away, away, teacher. Village. Wind. Teacher. <laughs> so now we'll play level designer or eight-year-old. <laughs> Any guesses? That is an eight-year-old. That's my son. His sister wants you to know that he helped, she helped tape the backpack onto him and made the fire. So um, if you leave an eight-year-old, Along, alone long enough, they often will make things in the kitchen, wherever. Sometimes they make their own toys, which are pretty awesome. Level designers are a lot like this. And um, they are also awesome. And when they're waiting for us to give them stuff, they've got nothing to play with, uh, no Legos to build, or no mega blocks to build their things with. And. Uh, They are both always busy. They often live in their own world. These are the similarities. And when bored, they make their own toys. So when we go and we walk through the world to check and see how the props are being used, we often see stuff like this. What the <laughs> hell is that? What? And then we just stare at it like, when look at, did you make, what? where did that come from? 
This is a shrine made from a shrine and a colander and a pear and a banana. They needed it. And uh, this, why? I didn't see a task come through for this thing, but they apparently needed a fell reaver made from a barber shop and uh, a goblin shredder and a mailbox. Believe it or not, this was inspired by the Pandaren mailbox. I talked to the designer and it, it's in there and somehow it made him think we need to do this with that mailbox. There. <laughs> we need crane statues for the crane area. This is made from items you can find around your home. I don't even need to explain this. I can't even figure out what half of this stuff is, but I think there's a bathtub in there and a trophy. And my favorite, the Pandaren hover tank made from a frying pan, a door, a still, some barrels, and now the animated props, which I'm going to leave you with. And this has not the weepy Chinese violins, but Dark Moon Fair music. Thanks, everybody. I think we've actually went way over, so I think we're out of time. You're welcome. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs>